thank you. Thank you for the nice, the nice introduction. Uh, yes, and I'm uh, uh, really happy to be here as well. Uh, it's always always fun um, to do something like this. So um, APIs, um, right? The when I was asked to give this 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 lecture, I thought, oh, that's there. That's that's fine. I've I've, I've written my own APIs. I've used lots of APIs. Um, It'll be uh, it'll be easy. Uh, um, yeah, we'll just uh, be fine. And when I started writing the slides, I suddenly realized that it's not quite as trivial because fundamentally the concept of an API is incredibly loosely defined. Here we go. So. Um, Instead of being able to, so because of the, the looseness of the definition, the way I'm going to run this uh, the session is that uh, in the first sort of half, approximately, of the um, of the session, I'll look at uh, what, at a very high level, are APIs and why do we use them? So basic structure. We'll have a look at, bit, at data formats, um, a bit of a how-to, so for the general level. And then um, in the second part, we'll look at uh, some actual examples. And we'll, we'll actually use uh, an API, or actually two APIs, and just have a look at what sort of the process of working with, uh, with an API. Yeah. OK. So, Question number one is is, obvious, is is always going to be why why do we need why do we use an API and the reason we we need and, and use them is because in our in our working uh, structure whether this is for for I'm going to call it practical purposes uh, administering some data or, or providing some kind of service. Um, or sort of a more perhaps a research focus point where you have where you are undertaking some kind of research with existing uh, data and services. Um, there's always there's always an interaction between you and this you here is is either you as a person or you as a as as a as a job so to say as as some as a as a as a role in a, in a in an organization. There's some kind of access to some data, there's access somewhere else perhaps to some services, and then there'll be a third access to, um, to some kind of storage system where you either store results or where you store um, just temporary intermediate stuff or, or something something else that has uh, that is sort of separate to, to, to the data that you're working with. And um, each time you you interact with the data, the services, and the data might be really just pure. Here, yeah, I'm cheating, say it's calling it, it's just call it pure data. So it's really just uh, uh, data without it, much um, ability to interact with the data. At this point, is just the raw data. You might take that, you might fetch parts of that from some kind of data source. Uh, you might then pass that on to some service. For example, if you're uh, if you're providing some kind of search, if you're working here on some kind of search system, then the initial data might be the the raw collection of texts that you're working with. That you fetch that, you pass that on to some service. Uh, the service might do very basic things like um, just uh, uh, splitting tokenization or filtering of of text or, or um, more complex things like topic modeling, any, anything can be that service. It could also be that the resulting search system is accessible, that you're building here is um, accessible via service or as a service. And or in a separate context, you might say, OK, well, the results of getting that service to run on my data get stored somewhere somewhere else. So these are all, there's, there's a huge amount of variation in how these patterns work. And there's no. There's no one pattern here, and um, 
that's what makes, in a way, this talk uh, a bit more tricky and a bit more, um, yeah, tricky for, for me to structure, is that there is so much flexibility. But every time, at each point where we have this, this pattern of requesting something from somewhere else, whether that's data, services, storage, and getting something back, that is essentially where you're using an API. And um, the way this, this works is that you have your request, you have your, and this request, as, as I said, it might just be a request for data. It might be a request to do something with some data you're providing. It might be a request to just store some data somewhere. These are all, the, re the term request here is defined really broadly. It's just that you are requesting something else to do something for you. So we have that, that, that's the interaction that you have with the API. Now, the API itself actually, the API itself doesn't, in, in general, doesn't do anything on its own. Rather, it passes your request on to uh, some kind of, to, to the data source, to the code that runs the service, to whatever is in the back backend of the, the, the service, the system, the data that you want to access. And what the API essentially is, is a contract between the, the service that is being provided, whether that's data or, or functionality, and you. Now the, the API specifies that if you ask me for this and provide this kind of data, then I will provide you with this in response. And that's why uh, you will see that when you're working with, um, with, API, with APIs, with services, uh, the, the best kind have some kind of versioning on their API, and they really provide uh, an ironclad contract, so to say, that as long as you access this version of the API with this kind of data, with this kind of request, then you will get this kind of, of, of data back. So that's, that's fundamentally, at this point, um, the talk is finished. So we can all go home now, because that is as much as you can really say about an API before about APIs in general, before getting really into the nitty gritty details of the specific API that you want to work with. So um, this is the point where I was a bit stuck when I was making my slide. I thought, well, I've got an hour to speak, um, two slides, not ideal. So um, I dreamed up a bit more stuff, uh, just a bit more to go into a bit more deep depth here. So. You have everything that we talk about now is um, applicable only within certain limits to certain, to certain APIs. Um, and these are really sort of high level groupings, but um, the boundaries here are fluid. And there's, it's often that you will, in practice, use uh, one type of API, which in the background asks another type of API, and that in background only has the actual data or service. So there might, there's often relatively instantly get into relatively complex, complex structures. But fundamentally, um, at a very high level, APIs can be can be split into, into two big groupings, and those are web service-based APIs, so things that are accessed via the web and software library API. So this is, is where you have some kind of programming library that you use in your programming language to do something. And the, the interaction point between your request and the API is that it follows that same contract principle, regardless of whether you are accessing via the web or accessing locally. The only real difference is that with the accessing locally, you have a bit more control over the uh, versioning of the API because it's up to you to upgrade uh, the local library and thus also its API. When we're talking about web service APIs, the 
defining aspect of them is really that they are accessed via the web and that data in, in both directions, the data that you provide to the API, data that uh, you get back through the API from the API generally falls into the three into the three large categories that are here is data in XML format, data in JSON format, and data in, in some kind of image format. Uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of APIs out there that also use other data formats. Uh, and one of the uh, trickiest things with using any kind of API is figuring out what format uh, they have and what how that format actually works. Um, but for the majority, the their, um, access is via, via one of these three um, data types. And web services will, in general, I mean, it says here may require, but in general, in practice, they will require authentication of some kind. Um, this may be either for actual sort of, some necessary purposes, so to say, you know, that um, there's some kind of um, financial transaction that's, that's linked to that, to that authenticated user, but it might also be just to ensure that certain fair use boundaries or um, usage patterns in, in, in can be tracked by the, by the service provider. On the software library side, we have, these are, as I said earlier, obviously accessed locally. And here the data is really in whatever format the um, library and the programming language that you're uh, dealing with provides. And the software libraries are obviously always specific to the programming language that you're using to interact with them. So uh, while a web service API is generally accessible from any programming language, a uh, software library will always be um, accessible only from the language that the library itself is, is built in. Now, in practice, um, or not in practice, but in, in practice, you will deal with both. And generally, in the sort of ideal case, you will actually deal with a, a software library that in the back end calls a web service. Uh, so the software library hides the complexity of dealing with the, of interacting with the web service. Um, but at the same time, you have that, that remote access. Because the software libraries are programming language specific and specific to whatever they, very specific to whatever they do. Uh, I'm gonna here now focus on just the, the web service APIs, just to, um, to give you an idea of, of what, what they look like a bit under the hood, so to say. Now, in, in the ideal case, you will never have to deal with them at this level, but um, and instead you will use some kind of library that provides a, a programming language um, specific API that hides the web service API in the background, but fundamentally uh, web service APIs, which are what we mostly use, are built around this request and response pattern that, that I'll now show a bit of an example. of. So um, what we have here is uh, the most important bit in the request that gets sent to the API is the URL, or specifically the path in the URL of the so-called API endpoint. Now, and here is where instantly there is nothing that I can say that is general um, because every API does this differently. Some APIs hide everything behind a single URL endpoint. And depending on what uh, query parameters or data you send or any other kind of there's a, a number there's a number of ways that you can pass information up there they then provide different responses on different services alternatively some apis have a separate endpoint for each kind of functionality that you want to request it's just very very flexible but regardless uh, this url you need to provide is the is the is the core part that you provide that you send as a request at the, uh, at the HTTP level, so same as in your browser, um, to, to, the, to the API. 
as I said, authentication is usually is generally uh, enforced um, or frequently enforced at least. Uh, and again, how this is handled, there are uh, innumerable types of ways of doing this. Um, we'll look at uh, one later on in the example that passes uh, authorization via query parameters to the URL. Here we have authorization passed via a specific header in the request. You're always stuck with looking into the documentation and figuring out how this actually works. And then any request has always has an optional body that we can use to send some data to, um, to, the, to, to the service. And then after we send this, um, we, um, we get a response back. And uh, that response generally looks like this. So uh, the server, the web service will send the status code, and 200 always means OK. There's always a so human readable. And then there'll be a lot of metadata there about the response. So what type of what data format here is quite useful then to see. Yeah, so here we see that uh, the data is coming back as JSON data. How much, data, how much data is coming back is not so important for us, but uh, the data itself is then what we're actually interested in. So this is the pattern for any kind of web service API, fundamentally. Um, exactly how data is passed up and how data is passed down will obviously vary as we'll, as we'll see uh, in, the, in the example later, but um, that's, that's sort of the, the core underlying structure. And if you're using a web service API, particularly if you're using it via the browser, um, I'll show you uh, in a moment, you can always actually see this interaction going on in the browser. Okay, uh, I'm briefly gonna um, um, I'm briefly gonna gonna say something about data formats. Um, I won't say too much about XML because um, I, I'm gonna just make an assumption here that most of us have been uh, exposed to XML at some point, whether we wanted to or not, whether we like it or not. Um, but fundamentally, <clears throat> XML is a, a markup language used to structure something. Uh, and it's, it does that by having opening and closing tags. So the opening marked by angle brackets and the closing tag marked additionally with that with a slash and uh, some kind of name for that tag. And by nesting these, we can create complex structures. We can also have, you know, the data can have attributes. So there's always an attribute name and then a value, and we can have some free text. Uh, perfect. Uh, it's ideal for, because it's such a flexible data format, you can structure any data into this kind of XML structure. We'll see in a moment as well what, how a completely different data structure in XML can, can look like, um, but it's very flexible. And that, the, at the same time, the flexibility is the difficulty because Whenever you get data in XML format, you need to now decide uh, what do the individual bits of the XML mean? And that is actually, and we'll see that in a moment, is the trickiest thing with using any kind of API is uh, figuring out what it actually means, what the data means that you're getting back. Now, one of the things that uh, people moan about with XML, um, perhaps, perhaps more in the tech community, I don't know, um, uh, but certainly they do is that uh, it's a very verbose format. Yeah, the, the tags are very, very, they take up a lot of, there's a lot of data being transmitted there, a lot of writing to do. So uh, an alternative format that has become relatively popular in the last oh, decade or so is JSON. This stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It, it comes out of the web development field. And really what it is, is a structured set of key value pairs. In that respect, it is really the same. It can do the same as XML uh, because XML is essentially also structuring between the tag name 
and its content. Uh, uh, additionally, you have the attributes, but the attributes are essentially also content. Uh, you can easily represent them like that. So there's no difference. We can do exactly the same with JSON as we can with, with XML. We always have um, our, our key. This is always going to be a, a text string of some kind. And then we have a value. And the fundamental most common types of values that we deal with are uh, text like here or uh, numbers. Yeah, numbers and text that we've got a text. And then um, larger sort of structuring data, um, uh, data types, namely lists of things. And uh, what in JavaScript object notation is uh, referred to as an object, but is really just a grouping of key value pairs into a logical unit of some kind. And in a way, the object grouping is like a, nest, a, a tag that wraps multiple other tags, but with the difference that here, the op, there is no name attached to that, to that wrapping. And so in that way, JSON is a bit more um, condensed. So those are really the two most, most common sort of data and text formats. And then uh, really an upcoming is relatively, is not that new, but it is the sort of the, the reach of it as an, as an, as an API structure um, has been really growing in, in the recent, recent past is the um, international image interchange format, I generally abbreviated as, well, I've never, I, I can never figure out how I, 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 F or, uh, or do you just say it out? If I am, anyway. Um, and the, this format is actually, uh, uh, it's a bit of a, it's a grouping API, so to say, because it actually consists of two, um, primarily consists of two main uh, sub APIs, which are an image API for access to the actual image data and an information API for access to uh, the, the metadata about the image. So here we've got two examples. So we can see that the image API, first, this is the scheme. So HTTP or, or HTTPS security, and the server, then the prefix, so any URL that you store and stuff under, uh, then the identifier of the image, then which region of the image, how, um, what size of, uh, of, um, of the image you want. Uh, and I'll get to that in a moment. Any rotation, uh, quality, and then the data format of the image that you want to get back. And we here see here uh, sort of a, an example uh, that actually doesn't work uh, because I haven't gone around to building that yet. But um, so the old joke archive has old jokes. Uh, here's an image, and it says, okay, here you have the prefix. So all our images are in this area of the URL. Um, and then we have the unique identifier for the uh, for that image. We say we want the full image, so that's the region, and we want it in the in the maximum um, size, so uh, in as high a resolution as we want. We don't want any rotation. We want the default quality, and we want it as a JPEG image. And so we send this request to the API, and it will send us back an image. Um, and when we have very large images because through the region uh, and size aspects, we can ask, uh, we can uh, build interfaces, to use the triple uh, IF, excellent, or uh, works for me, um, format image API here to then first request the full image, but in a very small you know, a thumbnail size. And as the user zooms in, we can first increase this, the size, but then we can also start reducing which segments which regions of the image we want to see because the user has zoomed into the top left corner or then we can ask it to only send us the top left corner and that way we reduce the amount of data that has to be transferred while still allowing uh, high granularity access in order to do this obviously you need to know um how much how what 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 regions what sizes what rotational quality and whatsoever what is available. And to that, there's the information API, which you can see is very similar, but it stops after the identifier and then just has a JSON file that contains all the metadata. 
And this can be metadata about the image itself, but also about all the various data. So it's metadata about the content of the image, but also metadata about and and anything, but about the technical aspects of the image. So those are really sort of the, the three most common types of data that, that, that will uh, push back and forth with, with an API. And so now we get to the point of how do we use it just as a very sort of high level. Um, so, so now that we have the interaction pattern with the API and the data formats, we can think about how do we actually use an API. And the most the trickiest thing is at the beginning. The first one is to find out that an API actually exists. So for example, in the, in the practical example, the one of the APIs that I'll show, um, you need to know that it's there. It's uh, publicly accessible, there's no uh, thing, but at least the last time I looked, there was no actual link to it on the project's website. So you know, if you know it's there, that's the first, that's a, a tricky first step. The next, tricky next step is finding out how it actually works. Yeah? Now in, in your uh, perfect ideal world, uh, the API uses a standard um, interaction format of some kind. Uh, and uh, what you learn from using the previous API, you can now apply here and you can instantly get the data. This uh, is true only for a very limited stuff, a set of um, APIs. Uh, in most cases, the APIs are custom to the provider and you need to hope that there is sufficient documentation to figure out what request you need to send to the um, to the, the, the API and what kind of data you will get back. One of the ways to sort of circumvent that a bit is, is usually worth looking whether they're for your chosen programming, unless you want to do the interaction by hand and you're stuck, but if you are going to do something out of some kind of scripting language or, or similar, uh, it's then worth in the next step or checking, is there an existing library that I can use that will allow me to, that simplifies access to this kind of API endpoint. Uh, the next step then, now, now you basically set up, uh, you know what requests to send, what data you're going to get back. Um, you know you've chosen your, your existing library. At this point, if there is any authentication tokens or anything similar required, you need to acquire those. And then you are ready to access the API. And this is the point where you will find out everything that is problematic with the data in the API and with the API itself, of course, because as soon as you are accessing the API, you will find out that nothing is very structured and that everything is a bit of a mess. So uh, this is where the, the fun part starts. So let's give that a go. I'm gonna escape here briefly. I'm just gonna... Can I just kind of just quickly check that everybody can still see uh, where I'm I'm messing about on the screen? Uh, you yeah. see now your computer. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Exactly. So let's start our container here. Has it already been shut down or is it gonna... Oh no, it's additional infrastructure. Okay. So while that boots up in the background, um, we'll have a look at one common um, API um, structure in in, a, so in the libraries and archives area, and that is uh, the um, um, OAI, OAI uh, PMH um, API uh, structure. So, uh, um, and this is a, a, an API for accessing archives collections is for, is for public, it was the PMH stands for public metadata harvesting. And this is important, the harvesting part is important because, um, because as we'll see in a moment when we mess about with it a bit, this format is really defined, 
uh, designed for getting all of the data held by an archive and uh, pulling it into a local copy. And we'll see that there's no ability here to do anything more, more interesting. We'll then also look at as a second API that is um, custom. We'll have a quick look at your piano. Uh, I mess about with that. So, and here we get, um, I'm just going to show you a bit really the sort of the fun of getting to start with a, a new API that you are perhaps not, not so familiar with. Um, so for example, if you have never dealt with the Digi Zeitschriften DE uh, um, endpoint, it provides a newspaper um, and periodical kind of data. And you've never dealt with OAI, OAI PMH um, API. All you can see is this: is a, there's a number of links here uh, and a number of stuff. Um, okay. Now you're stuck. Uh, and here, there's two two approaches. There's the probably the sensible approach, which is to go and see if you can find some documentation on OAI PMH, and then use that. Or you can take the computer scientist's approach which I always recommend as a computer scientist, and that's just to start clicking randomly, okay? And after a while, um, you sort of get an idea of what, um, of what the API is actually doing. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on that. Okay, that's almost done, perfect. But I am going to do something, and that is because uh, we're accessing it via the, um, by the web here, we can, if we go, if we right click and say view page source, we can see, now this is not very helpful, huh? but we can see here the XML, we can see that OAI, OAI PMH sends data as XML, and we can see how it's structured, okay? So it's not very pleasant to read, so it really in practice we want to use some kind of library to deal with the XML, but we can see the, the, the content here. Um, that's the wrong one. Oh, sorry, I've been um, I've been assessing students' work. Uh, anyway, do you only see on where on building Web, app, um, web applications for mobile. So, um, but if we look at, if we right click and say inspect, or you can find it via the developer tools here as well. Uh, and F12 generally works. If we reload the page, then we can see here, here's the request. So OAA PMH uses a single API endpoint with parameters to provide the actual request functionality that you're asking. And then if we look at, this in the network here, we can select the request here. Um, a bit bigger. We can select the request and we see here, uh, this is the URL requested. Uh, it said that our yeah, request was okay. And we got all kinds of content type. We can also look at, Okay, this is, I know I've just been a long time since I last I I did this. It didn't um, translate this, but here you can see the the underlying source as well, a bit more more neatly formatted, and this is really the way that you then slowly dig into the the API um, to understand what data you're getting back and what um, what you need to. Um, what you need, what you can do with it. So, um, but as I said, in practice, the first step is always to look at if there is um, a library available for, for interacting with, an, uh, um, with this kind of, with the API that you've got. And for example, here in Python uh, for OE, OAI PMH, there is, um, and for a few other things, there's a there's a few other things. There's a library called um, Polymathea, um, and I'll, I'll share all the details on these things afterwards. 
uh, so you can have a look at yourself if you want. And um, this uh, allows us to run some the same things that we just saw in the browser, uh, but here now allows us to run them uh, with an abstraction. So we now we don't have to worry about any of the the XML structure and everything. So we just say uh, give it tell it the metadata format reader tells us what tells us what metadata formats are available. So we can see here we can get the data as um, doubling core or as mets. If we want to um, fetch some data, let's just get some more data here. Um, here, uh, we now use a different class. And, and uh, again, here, what we're doing here is really is accessing a local library as a local API, which in the background then talks to the web service API. The advantage being that this simplifies things. So um, we're just now saying, okay, give us all the records here, at most one record, play, and then limit, limit it to one record. So we'll just get the first record that um, it returns us. And here we now, we can now see the API response uh, for that. So we see that the first, um, and this again is it using, is using, it's using JSON as a data format, even though in the background it's talking to the OAI interface using XML, it translates that into, into a JSON structure uh, so that uh, you can always treat it as an as a, as a object structure. We see here that, and then, and now it's really now dealing with an API. This is where the tricky thing is: is that dealing with the API, any API that we want to use at this point is really a, a matter of digging into the data and understanding what is available, what isn't available, what can you do with the data, what can't you do with the data. So, for here, instance, here we see: okay, we have a header with an identifier, uh, it's useful, and we know that this. Uh, again, we we have to go and look up documentation here, but if you look at the OAI PMH documentation, it'll tell you that the identifier is, is unique. So we can use that as a unique identifier within the data fetched from this source. And then there's obviously also a metadata key here, which has further further things. And, we have, and again, the question now is what do these things mean? Well, uh, you have to look at the documentation. So here it says DC title, we can make a, um, a bit of a jump of imagination, say, oh, we're probably probably going to be a Dublin Core. So it's a Dublin Core title. Ah, that, yeah, we know what that means. This means it's the title. And so here, this is the rise and fall of Archaic Miletus um, by Dina Goose. And it's an article in the subject 900 history. It's in English and German. And uh, there's also some formats that you can have this data, the actual data, not the metadata in. Um, the DC identifier again, and so on, okay? And we see that the data here is relatively limited because this is what is available via the um, DC Dublin Core data. But um, if, we, if we know from our earlier interaction with the um, with the with the API that it also provides data as uh, as mets mets mods. Um, then we can tell the library and in the background the back end API that we want to see the metadata in just that format. If we run this again. We can now see that um, the data come back in Mets mods, and we can see that in this data format, there is a lot more data here. So here, for example, we have um, references to actual uh, to the actual data that that this metadata record is describing. 
and also um, a lot more other metadata uh, structures. So let's just, if we know a bit, a bit more about the, the um, what's it called? The API um, contract, uh, OAI, OAI PMH does not allow you to search the, the remote um, data, but it does have this concept of a so-called set. And a set is a grouping of items in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the data store that has been made by the people providing the service, okay? So you can't say, you can't create any sets as a user, but you can ask um, the OAI endpoint, to tell you, um, oh, to, no, of course, don't import it, that won't work. You can ask the OAI PMH endpoint to tell you what sets are available. And for example, here we see that Sets in OA PMH always have a spec, which is the identifier used by the system, and then a name, a human readable name. So here is the Europeana data. So that's the data that has gone into Europeana from uh, Digit Zeitschriften. And we can now use this um, to filter, filter the data that we get back a bit. So here we can say, um, yeah, give us records. Give us the metadata records in Mets mods again, but only those that come from that specific set. If we run that, I'm not going to go into the details here. But we get a nice error, which is always which is the important thing. Uh, we see here that in the earlier data, if we look at the data here. We can see that we can dig down into the metadata, into the METs, and so on to get specific elements, like, for example, um, the title of, of, this, of this work. Uh, and in the, the, in the library that I'm using here, Polymathea, we can use just as a simple dot notation that allows us to dig down that tree of, of nested objects. So we can see here we get the DMD sequence, we get the first one out of the sequence. Uh, we then use the, get the wraps object and the XML data, then we get into the, um, the mods data, then here the title info, the title, and then the text. Okay, and depending on how the data formula is structured, this can, these can, as we can see, get relatively complex. And this is the, the beauty of the thing. Uh, here we see a nice error, um, and that error is actually caused because we're accessing the first one of the sequence. And here we, we run into one of these entertaining aspects when dealing with any kind of API is that uh, the sequence is only um, a sequence if there are more than one DMD sec, sec objects, otherwise it's just a single object. And uh, we're not handling that, we're, we're just assuming there's always a list and so it fails. So in practice, we would now have to then check whether this part of the document is a list. And, and this is where working with APIs just gets very complex and very hard and very API specific because you need to deal with the specific problems in that specific API. Okay, so that's one. We'll have a look at a second one here um, with Europeana. Right, I'm just briefly going to move this onto the other screen while I... So Europeana uh, requires uh, an API key to be to for... Um, well, mainly because they... Um, 
they want to keep track that you're not overusing their, their services because they are free. And so I just need to um, I just need to get that in here. I have not got enough screens. Two monitors, just not enough. Okay. I delete that again. So now Europeana APIs, we can see them on the website. And you can see they have a lot of them. Okay. So I'm just going to do one. I mean, the search API. And if we scroll down, um, we can see that they actually provide some documentation. Okay, unlike the other API where you were stuck with finding about, about what is in the data somewhere else, the European API provides some very nice documentation that you can, um, the real problem with the European uh, API is not that it uh, isn't documented, but that there's a lot of options, a lot of documentation that you need to um, work your way through. But apart from that, uh, the principle is the same. We access we again use a library to hide the access to the API. And we need to provide it with our API key. And European API is now different to the other IPMH API, is that it provides a search. Um, API, so you can and you must tell the API what you are, what it is that you're looking for. So here we're now just going to search, um, search for the keyword Python, and we'll just tell it that we only want one record, and we'll output it. Let's run that. API key doesn't exist, but I just ran that. Okay. Fair enough. It would be boring if everything worked. Let's give it another go. Oh. <laughs> There you go. Uh, as always, a uh, problem exists between keyboard and chair. And um, I, uh, when you apply for an API key, you get an API key and a private key. And for this part, you only need the API key. And I'd use the private key instead of the API key. And uh, Bianca, nothing works. And now here we see um, the data that comes back from Europeana. OK. This is from the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. It's a long description. Uh, and see, they provide uh, descriptions in, in theoretically in multiple languages, um, but it's only available in one language. And here we find something else. And this is the other part that makes working with APIs so uh, interesting, is that when you have overcome and we saw that already in the OA IPMH aspect a bit, but as when you have overcome the variation and the fun in understanding uh, how to use the API, then comes the fun and understanding of how to use uh, the actual data and how to under and work with the data, and also how to um, what post-processing you need to do in order to get a data source that we um, that we can actually uh, do something with afterwards. So for example, um, I think 
just as, a, as an example, and we won't, I won't look at this here in any more detail, but we can see that if for the simple, that in this tutorial, uh, uh, there's um, the query we ran for, the data that comes back, um, for example, the language marker uh, comes back in at least three versions. And if we actually dig a bit deeper, we'll find that there's at least another two uh, different types of or different values for, for just marking out the German language. That's not to speak of uh, the other languages. So um, that's one of the, the, the really tricky parts of then dealing with an API is um, finding out where, uh, where, where, where the breaking points are. And I, uh, um, I had an interesting, I heard a completely unrelated uh, talk about software, um, software architecture, well, software architects and, and creating software architectures. And yesterday, and, and he, he introduced this concept where he yeah, described this concept of having of um, uh, external stresses acting on your work or on the software. And that if the, stre and the stresses, like uh, physical stresses on a physical construction, if they can break, the construct, and that's the same thing here. There are a lot of um, a lot of external stresses acting on any kind of um, any kind of APIs, what any kind of on the systems and data that sit behind the APIs um, front end, the API that you interact with, and when you're working with the API, you should essentially make think about what potential stresses can be acting on that in the background and these are things like um the person writing the archive the, the, if it's say a service api saying yeah the person writing the archive the, the service only ever dealt with text in um language x so even though they're providing a very generic service that should not make a difference. They've only ever tested their system with and stressed their system based on one language. You feed another language and you'll get some interesting results. Uh, so these are kind of things that you can just work through now. You know, we all know that um, the process of cleaning data for ingestion into any kind of archive is a complex and long one and will inevitably uh, create um, inconsistencies. This just um, that's the way it is. Otherwise, it'd be boring. Uh, but we can think of the stresses that are working there. Yeah? Okay, so um, time is an obvious, always an obvious constraint on the people checking stuff manually. Uh, so, what kind of data mistakes could, what kind of data stresses could could be there based on? Uh, just the, our knowledge that the people working this only have very limited time of preparing this. And that way you can um, avoid uh, creating um, code, uh, creating things that work with the APIs that break very quickly and very easily, but um, it's a tricky thing. And uh, because of the variation and the huge amount of variation between API, every API will essentially look different. The OAI PMH is sort of an almost an exception in the API world in that it is a standard and that you will find it for a lot of archives, but it is very limited because it's not meant for queries. So you want to use, uh, say, the Digi-Zeitschrift archive via their OAI PMH thing, you will have to accept that you are going to download massive amounts of data and you only want 5% of that, 1% of that, but because of the API constraints, you can't get more. And so this is, um, that's the essentially the reason why in practice there are so many APIs because they are generally designed for the specifics of the data set that sits behind it or the service that sits behind the API. Pleasure. And um, 
that really brings me to the end here because anything more than this, we'd instantly, we'd really start having to think about also what is our question? What is the question? What is the, the, the goal of our activity, of our interaction with this API rather than just looking at APIs uh, in general? Oh, of course, it takes me to the beginning. And with that, there we go, final slide. Thank you very much. Thank you.